Yeah. He is risen. <clears throat> Happy Easter, everyone, and welcome to the Beacon Hill Fellowship. Whether you're here in person or you're watching this recording online, we are so happy that you have joined us for this Easter service. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our guest. Maybe it's your first time visiting with us, or maybe it's just been a while since you've been here. Either way, we are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning, and you are always welcome here at the Beacon Hill Fellowship. Last year on Easter Sunday, Tim read from Matthew's account of the empty tomb. And I remember hearing, after hearing that story, I remember thinking how afraid Mary Magdalene and the other Mary must have been when they first found that empty tomb. And how surprised they must have been when the angel told them that he is not here, he is risen. Think of how much joy they had when the angel told them that he is alive and they will see him again in Galilee. I can only imagine. But my hope is that you will experience at least some of that joy this Easter as you think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, the ultimate example of true love. Well, each week, as we do every week, we follow in the footsteps and the teachings of Jesus to be, and to learn how to become better Christians because we want to become the type of Christians that Jesus wants us all to be. And one way we remind ourselves how to do that is through our ethos statement. We like to say our ethos statement each week as a congregation because it holds some of those values that are so important to us. It also describes the community that we strive to be. So I hope you'll join me in reading our ethos statement together. Married, divorced, or single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative or liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big or small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt or believe here, we all can receive here. Gay or straight here, there's no hate here. Woman or man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, or all of us grace here, an imitation of the remarkable love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live and love without labels. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, hope of the world, by your spirit draw us together in unity and strength. Help us to thrive in both the good times and the bad and to continue to put our trust in you. Pour out the gifts of your spirit that we may mature in our faith, grow in our ministry, and find ourselves looking for new opportunities to serve you and others. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> Bella, who also is wearing her ears on top of her head, double bunny dared me to wear these ears, and I think they match my shirt, so it was a good choice. So it, as we've already heard, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. It is also what we call Easter Sunday. And you've heard me, if you've been following me on Facebook, I've been reminding you that these, this holiday has had a deeper significance in our past, especially across Northern Europe, even before Christianity arrived, because Easter was actually the name of a, of a German fertility goddess. Yeah, indeed. Often celebrated with bunny rabbits and eggs. Long before Christianity came to Northern Europe, Easter was celebrated this time of year, a whole month of Easter, corresponding to our month of April, springtime, renewal, new beginnings. And so when Christianity arrived, Yes, it included um, not only the stories about Jesus' resurrection, but they still carried on some of the practices of the bunny rabbits and the Easter eggs and all the things we associate with this time of the year. So what we do each week, and I thanks for these guys up here who come to, to share their beautiful music with us, we time, have a little time where we share joys and sorrows. So if you can bear to share your joys and sorrows with a man in bunny rabbit ears, uh, that's what we're going to do for the next few moments as we, as we continue our service.
The scripture today is taken from Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2 and 12 to 24. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is written. Thank you, Janine, for that reading from the 118th Psalm. This is a selection of that very long psalm, but you'll notice if you have been around the church for long, there are several references that the earliest followers of Jesus took from that psalm and applied to Jesus, particularly about his triumph over death, staring death in its face, experiencing it, but triumphing over it, and how that... Uh, the stone that the builders rejected had, became, had become the chief cornerstone of an early movement of followers of Jesus that would grow to become the call, become or be called the church. And so we're here to celebrate that fact today. But I also want to draw your attention to another selection, one that we often read uh, during these kinds of days. And it's found in the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. So I want to read to you a portion from the scriptures of early Christianity, beginning with verse 1. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, that is Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed, for you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing more to anyone, for they were afraid. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you read the Gospel of Mark, you're probably in for a surprise when you come to the traditional ending of it, because that's where it traditionally ended which sounds quite odd because at the end of verse 8, it just simply says, after Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, as well as Salome, had been instructed to go back and tell the disciples as well as Peter of what they had discovered at the empty tomb and the news that he had been raised from the dead and was going to meet them in Galilee. The Gospel of Mark ends in the strangest possible way. It says they were so afraid they didn't tell anyone. Now guess what? Of course they did, eventually. Because you wouldn't have the Gospel of Mark if they hadn't told anybody. But Mark ends it there, as far as we can tell. That was so confusing to people in the early days of the Christian church that they actually created two more endings, two more alternate endings to it. One is a short one, and one is a much longer one. In all contemporary versions of the Bible, it will note that if you're reading along and it says shorter ending of Mark, then it says longer or larger ending of Mark. 
there were two options because no one was satisfied with the notion that the women just simply left the, uh, the tomb so afraid that they didn't tell anyone because we know, we know the rest of the story. But I want to point out to you, the first ending is a shorter ending, and it's there. It's very simple. It's clearly not in the same language as the rest of the gospel is written. You can tell that in English as well as in the, in the Greek text as well. And it just simply says, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward Jesus himself sent out, or sent them from east to west to the sacred and to, that should be proclaimed, to sacred and imperishable pro proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. Easy for me to say. And that's the short ending. In other words, a preacher couldn't have written that because he said it's in very, a great economy of words, right? But a preacher had to have written the second one. It's the longer one. And I'm not going to read every bit of it, but if you trace down through that, basically what this person did who wrote this longer ending, and it appears to have been written in the second century or toward the end of the second century. The first one in the fourth century. We're talking about decades after the time of Jesus. Decades after the stories recorded would have been told. And in this longer ending, it goes through, a, it just really takes the other three Gospels and it pulls stories from them and then tries to end Mark with that. What's particularly interesting is that this is the part, scroll down, which talks about them being able to take up and drink poison and not be harmed by it. Or take up the serpents and not be bit, and be bitten and not die from the poison. You've heard of snake handling? That's where this comes from. It perhaps was an unfortunate ending, especially for those preachers from time to time in the mountains who die from rattlesnake bites in the service. That does still happen. But it's based on this text, the longer ending of Mark. But all we really know is that the, the, this gospel originally ended on this kind of strange note. People have questioned why it would end that way. Well, if you follow the entire gospel through from beginning to, to the end, you'll find that it's a constant theme for this particular author. You see, he portrays Jesus' disciples as fairly bumbling, a little clueless, and particularly easily intimidated. It is almost certain this author was writing at a time of intense persecution surrounding the time when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. It was a very hectic time in their lives, and they were tempted to be afraid at all that was going on in the world. And so this author is trying to remind them being afraid is not incompatible with following Jesus. Being intimidated by the moment you happen to be in is not necessarily a disqualifier for being a follower of Jesus. You see, he said it happened with the disciples and Peter, and we're going to see it even happened amongst the group of women who followed Jesus. Because the title of my talk this morning is Three Women and an Empty Tomb. And I want to discuss this story and how it begins with you, one you've heard before. But if you read all four Gospels, you know they tell the story differently. All, three, all four Gospels have a different combination of a group of women who are a part of Jesus' entourage from Galilee. We all think about the 12 disciples, right? There are also a group of women. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that there were at least seven or more who were part of Jesus' group that traveled together all around Galilee and ultimately made the trip to Jerusalem with him. In Mark's gospel, they're pretty consistent. They're Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, or Joseph, and then Salome. I'm going to talk about those three women, but let me give you a little bit of the story before I get to the women themselves. We're told that when Jesus died on the cross, these three women were present. Now, if you remember, all of the men were gone. They'd hightailed it. You know what it means to hightail? They took off. One of the disciples of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest him was so frightened, it says that when they went to grab him, they tore his clothes off and he, he streaked away. You ever heard of streakers? This is a gospel reference to a streaker. He was ran, ran away naked. He was such a hurry to get away. It says that Jesus even anticipated it in the upper room when he told them that they're going to strike the shepherd and the sheep are going to be dispersed, they're going to be scattered. So the men were all in hiding. They were not present at the crucifixion of Jesus. As far as we know, the only people of Jesus' disciples who observed Jesus dying on the cross were a group of women that came with him and supported him from Galilee. 
The women alone maintained the courage and commitment to Jesus to be with him there in that moment when he was being crucified for leading a movement that they were a part of. Now, I get it. It may very well be that women in that world could fly under the radar because, again, they were not given the credibility that men were, been, uh, were given in that world, and that's a shame. But it says these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome were with Jesus watching him die on the cross. Furthermore, it says when Joseph of Arimathea, one of the members of the Jewish high council, asked um, Pilate for Jesus' body, and Pilate allowed him to take the body of Jesus and bury it in one of his own tombs, literally in a cave-like structure. He put Jesus' body wrapped in a, a linen cloth and then rolled a big stone over it. It says that the end of chapter 16, it was Mary Magdalene, and this time it's only Mary, the mother of Joseph, are standing there watching, observing where Jesus was buried. In other words, the only two people that knew the location of Jesus' tomb were two of the three women that are mentioned who were at his crucifixion. That brings us to early on the first day of the week. The Romans called it Sunday, the day of the sun. The Jews just simply ordered it in terms of day one. First day of the week, second day of the week, third day of the week, fourth day of the week, fifth day of the week, sixth day of the week, and the Sabbath, going all the way back to the stories in the opening chapter of the book of Genesis. So this is the first day of the week. The Sabbath is ended. Mary Magdalene, who, by the way, in every reference to the group of women that follow Jesus, is always mentioned first. I'll come back to that. She, along with these two other women, the other Mary and Salome, purchase spices because they intend to anoint the dead body of Jesus and as they're on their way to the tomb that early morning after dawn they have a discussion among themselves well who's going to remove the stone unlike Mark unlike Matthew's gospel there's no contingent of soldiers there guarding it it's just the tomb alone by itself Mark has no reference to those soldiers or people there so they make their way to the tomb and they discover that their stone that large stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb had already been rolled away and they enter into the tomb and they see this young man, he's not described, he's told, he's described, not, not named, he's simply described as wearing white clothing, a white robe. Perhaps people have suggested an angel, a messenger from God, but we're not told. And he gives them the instructions that you're looking for Jesus, aren't you? Well, he's not here. He's been raised. And he wants you to go to Galilee and meet him there. In other words, go back to your home region and meet him there. And it says then that the women, instead of going back and giving the instructions to Peter and the other disciples, decide we're so frightened we're not going to tell anybody anything, which leaves us puzzled. The other gospels clean it up and the longer endings clean it up. But let's focus on those women for a moment. It is remarkable to tell the story this way, but all four gospels do it. You see, in the ancient world, women were not given much credibility. A woman really could not even bear witness, per se, in a legal proceeding in that world. She was considered to be that inferior. But in all of our Gospels, something is constant that seems counterintuitive to that world. And that it was what women that remained committed to Jesus through everything to the extent that they show up when all the rest of the men are in hiding. They take the risk. They discover the empty tomb, and while they don't immediately tell it, ultimately we know all the Gospels record it, the only reason that the story got out, that the tomb was empty, and that Jesus somehow survived his own demise was because women showed their commitment and their dedication to Jesus through, to, and through the bitter end to the glorious new day. That should not escape us. I try to mention it every year. By the way, there's one woman. The women are somewhat interchangeable, and it's hard to keep up with them. There's Mary, Mary, Mary. They're everywhere. I know in our church we've had situations like that. We've had a couple of Sues. We've had several Marys. We've had, uh, we've had some, a couple of Ralphs. We've had some Bills. We, we just go around the room. We just had for, sometimes we had so many people by the same name, we had to make sure we call them by the last name just so we know who they were talking about. But in the Gospels, you have Mary, Mary everywhere. It was the most common name in the first century world. I mentioned last year 
in this same service that over the last 100 years, Mary has been the most common name in American culture and society. It's a very common name. It goes all the way back to Moses, Sister Miriam or Mary. So it was a very common name. So it's hard to keep everybody separated. And in this version of the story, there's actually two Marys and a Salome. First of all, who was Salome? We're not told in this gospel. Best we can tell from tradition is it may very well be the first time the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, is mentioned. Very likely the mother of James and John. Now, if you remember James and John, they were some of the earliest disciples that Jesus called. Remember, he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he first encountered Simon Peter and Andrew, Simon's brother, who were fishing with their father. They were cleaning their nets after having fished all night. And Jesus called Simon and Andrew to come and follow me, and I'll make you, fish, make you fishers of people. Goes on down the way near the Sea of Galilee, he spots James and John, the sons of Zebedee. The mother's name is not mentioned there, but apparently her name was Salome. And she, along with her sons, because you remember in one of the Gospels when her sons were asking Jesus about being able to sit on the right hand and the left hand in his coming kingdom, she tried to intervene for him according to some of the stories. So she too, not just the sons, but she too was a part of Jesus' kind of moving band of followers that, that traveled about the region. So here she is, continuing to show her dedication. Even though her sons are missing, she's not missing in action. She's willing to put it on the line to continue to make a commitment to Jesus, Salome. And then there's Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, a puzzling person. Interestingly enough, you go back to Mark chapter 6, verse 3, you find out that Jesus' mother Mary had some other sons and daughters. And it says her first two sons were named James and Joseph. So some people have thought, was this the mother of Jesus present in the story? But it doesn't say she's the mother of Jesus. So some people have concluded that this Mary was not the mother of Jesus, but was the mother of James, son of Alphaeus, one of Jesus' disciples. Sometimes called James the lesser. The greater was uh, Jesus' brother, James, the son of his mother, Mary. But if this is so, if this is Mary, the mother of James, the son of Alphaeus, and his brother, Joseph, or Joseph, then this is another woman who not only allowed her son to follow Jesus, but she joined the group and she supported it and ministered to Jesus and the other disciples as they moved about the country proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom of God. So once again, another woman who has demonstrated her commitment was more dedicated than any of the men in the room. And that brings us to the one that's always mentioned first in every list of women in the Gospels. Every time the group's mentioned, the group of women that follow Jesus, one woman is mentioned first. Her name is Mary Magdalene, probably meaning Mary of Magdala. Magdala was a fishing village on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, a region that Jesus had been very familiar with. We're told that seven, seven demons were cast out of her. Now, for us today in the modern world, we hear that and we think, well, that's strange. We think of Hollywood movies like The Exorcist. But here, the demon is probably a other way of saying that she was deeply troubled, perhaps struggled with depression, some sort of mental illness, and Jesus somehow delivered her from that. And she became one of his closest followers. She is always mentioned first. That's not an accident. Every time the 12 disciples are mentioned, do you know who's always named first? Anybody remember? Every time the 12 are mentioned, and sometimes they're interchangeably. Anybody want to guess? Anybody awake? <laughs> Simon Peter. Simon, whom Jesus nicknamed Peter, meaning rock. All right? Well, the rock had a little problem. The rock shattered when it really mattered. Wow, that rhymed. It shattered. He shattered when it really mattered. Because you remember what happened to the rock? That sturdy rock that you could always depend on? He promised Jesus that everybody else may scatter, Lord, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stick with you through thick and thin. Jesus says, well, no, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what happened. And we're told that 
Simon went away and wept bitterly because of his failure. By the way, when it says that the young man in the tomb tells the women to go tell the disciples and Peter, it's saying that, yes, Judas has been left behind, but not Peter. He's still fully welcome and included in that number. He needed that encouragement. But Simon, always mentioned first from the 12, is no longer around because he's weeping and in hiding in fear for his life. But Mary Magdalene, who's always mentioned first among all the women, is not only present, she's leading the others to make sure that they show the proper dedication and honor to the life of Jesus. And they show up at the tomb expecting to find a dead body there, but instead find out in some marvelous, miraculous way, Jesus has been transformed from death to life again. And whatever happened there in that tomb, one thing we know is certain, that his earliest followers believed something happened in such a way that he was no longer a dead memory, but a living reality in their lives. And it moved them to tell that story far and wide. And it would not have happened if it hadn't have been for the leadership of Mary Magdalene. She is called to this day the apostle to the apostle. So we're here talking about this today because of the dedication of women. Now I've grown up in the church and I've pastored churches and I've served in different ways. I've served in a denomination that one time seemed to be so obsessed with keeping women out of any kind of power or giving them any kind of say so uh, that they spent whole whole months at their local conventions, at their national conventions, trying to find new ways to make sure women understood that they need to stay in their place and to not say anything out loud that somehow might offend the men. I grew up in that world and left it. That world still exists. Whether it's the Southern Baptist Convention or the Roman Catholic Church, the largest Protestant body in America and the largest Catholic body anywhere still have a, a backwards-looking, narrow-minded view about women and their capability and their power. But not the Gospels, not the stories of the empty tomb. They see women as vital, critical, to the whole story even getting out in the first place. Sure, they were fearful, they were intimidated in that time, but somehow they overcame their fear, they overcame their intimidation, and the word got out, and it got out because three women and an empty tomb transformed the story about Jesus from what appeared to be a dead end to a new transition and way of thinking about the world. We need to have that transition all over again in our own generation. So when we look at people, we no longer look at them in terms of whatever their gender is or their sex or their sexuality or sexual orientation, all the things that we somehow try to take a label and apply it to somebody and then limit them and dismiss them as not important, as important to God as the men are. No, the message, the liberating message of the gospel is Jesus not only welcomed women into his community, but he also elevated them into the highest levels of leadership and proclamation of the age-old message that we talk about every year at Easter. And it's really a bigger message than just simply about men and women. It's about everybody, everywhere, regardless from where you come from. You are important to God. You matter to God. Never let anybody tell you because of some immutable trait that you're born with or that you have that somehow you're less than or other than or somehow diminished because you don't look like the men who are trying to stay in control of things. I hope the Beacon Hill Fellowship will always be a place that has that liberating message that you find in the earliest stories in the very first gospel. As far as we know, Mark was written first. And the first story, the first time this story is told, it opens up not only a tomb, but it opens up a pathway to a better way of thinking about one another as an entire human family. So on this Easter Sunday, I hope you'll go out and tell the word. Don't be afraid to tell the word. 
to tell the word that God accepts all people regardless of any quality characteristic you have or were born with and welcomes you into his community and no one anywhere ever should limit you in the name of God but rather liberate you to be whom God made you to be and I hope the best version of whom God made you to be that is the glorious message of Easter Sunday may we pray now thank you Lord for this time we've had to share and meditate on this old old story and how hopefully we can see fresh insights from these stories and take these stories and apply them to our lives in such a way that we can live boldly before you as we are hoping to become a better version of who we are so that we can in turn experience your love and grace in our lives and extend that love and grace to other people everywhere so that we might not be a people who are trying to bottle up and control you but rather who release you and allow your spirit to work and strive in people's lives wherever they be and wherever they may come from so that we may all move toward a greater love of humanity and one another regardless of our interesting differences. Help us to follow this example and may, us, may we also have the courage to shout it from the rooftops and go tell it on every mountain we climb. We pray this in the name of the Christ. Amen. Will you stand? We're going to sing again. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the beautiful music. Thank you, Jason, for organizing it. Let me just say, if you have a spiritual need and like to talk with someone, I'd love to talk with you. There are multiple ways you can do that. You can tap me on the shoulder before we go. You can reach out to me uh, by email, timofbeaconfellowship.org. Or my phone number is on the website. You can call me or text me, and I'll love to sit down and talk with you about whatever is on your mind. Uh, you may be interested in about becoming, knowing more about the Beacon Hill Fellowship. I'd like to have that conversation with you. Maybe you'd like to become a member of our church. We'd love to, to welcome you into our community as we're trying to build one that uh, represents the kinds of things we've talked about this entire service. And we'd love to have you be a part of that and join us on that journey. I want to go over a few things by way of announcements. You guys can relax, whatever you need to do. Let me run through these things right quick. Um, this just tells you how you can give. We're going to have an offering and pass the plate in just a moment. But especially those who watch uh, on video, we have people who support our congregation who never even show up in person to worship. But uh, that's how you can give if you want to do that. But a few things are also going on in the life of our fellowship. Um, one great hour share. We come to a close of that, I think, maybe next week. And it was done uh, this, was this year. This is Presbyterian offering, one great hour sharing. Every year we give you an opportunity to give to this effort, but it supports Presbyterian uh, international missions and several good works through our Presbyterian connection. But we doing, did it this year in honor of uh, uh, the late uh, Dottie Cushman who passed away this past year. And so far we've raised $345 for this effort as of uh, the 17th of March. So if you'd like to give, just make sure you note on your check or however you give that you want a portion of it to go toward this effort. Also, uh, the Beacon Hill Lunch and Learn, we've been talking, we've been doing this uh, on Wednesdays, one Wednesday out of each month at 12 noon. Just bring your own bag of lunch or however you'd like to do it uh, with your lunch. Uh, coming up April the 17th, the next installment is Mary and Ryan from uh, the local Sierra Club. And she's going to talk about local environmental ecological concerns here in, uh, the, in, in Polk County. And this will be a time for you to hear some important information about what's going on uh, in our own local environment. But also throughout the month of April, we're going to be emphasizing Earth Day and, and how that we can be good stewards of, uh, of creation that God has entrusted to us. So I hope you'll, you'll come and invite a friend. We take an hour, and then we kind of move on and get you go back to your work or wherever you need to do. So that's coming up April the 17th at noon uh, on, um, well, noon right here uh, at the church. And there'll be others coming up on that too. Next Sunday, next Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall, the discipleship team will be leading in the book, store, book study about caste, the origins of, our, origins of our discontents. I hope you've read or are reading Isabel's Isabel Wilkerson's, there's the breakdowns, a uh, wonderful book. Uh, I, I, it's wonderful. I say wonderful. It's a powerful book um, that talks about caste in the United States, our caste system, particularly regarding race, and how that, that continues to reverberate in our current cultural debates in our lives. Read this powerful book. Um, I, I, it's one of those books you read, and I said it was wonderful. Well, it was wonderful if you like a gut punch from time to time, 
about the way that the white majority in this country have abused um, our fellow citizens from Africa, of African descent as well as other parts of the world who have come here as well as the native populations that we imposed upon when we arrived. Or let's say we, those of us who are white, primarily from Northern European uh, ancestry, some terrible things have been done. This book brings out many of them. It's going to be an important discussion and it will take place each week uh, throughout the Sundays in April during that time slot, 9.30 a.m. Come next week, invite a friend. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please sign up if you'd like to participate. We just want to have a number, kind of a number, so we know how to do some of the things we're going to do as we lead the discussions. But that breaks down what we're going to be looking at uh, in that, that book. And the ladies' luncheon, April the 13th, 11.30 a.m. That's a Saturday at Jennifer Gardner's home. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table. If you'd like to participate in that, I encourage you to do so. And discipleship team meeting April 7th the church at the after church in the fellowship hall. You know who you are. Uh, in the month of April, those are some things that we're doing for Dick Dixieland Elementary. Just some snacks if you'd like to help in one of those. So that would be a great help to us. And next, peace rally April the 8th. We're getting closer and closer to the action. Peace is the Polk Ecumenical Action Council for Empowerment. If you've never heard it before, it's a social justice ministry that our congregation is a part of, along with something like, I think, 28, nearly 30 different congregations across Polk County. The rally gets us ready for the action. The action is the really big event. That's something that we want to encourage you to begin to think about who you'll invite. The more people we have from our church as well as these other churches, the greater impression we'll make on our local elected officials so that we can get action, especially in matters like um, uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, we've been working hard on affordable housing. Elder care is one of the central themes that will be taken up and that I believe will be explained how it will be approached at the rally. So the rally is a April the 8th at the First Missionary Baptist Church in Winter Haven. That's where we'll hear more about the specifics of the upcoming Nehemiah action uh, from the research committee, and it'll primarily be the issues of elder care and adult pre-arrest pre diversion program that we've been working on here in the county. Now, let me just say a word for that before I move on. Now, the Beacon Hill Fellowship is part of our DNA to remind ourselves regularly. It's easy for us to think just because everything's going fine with me and mine. And people who look like me, think like me, dress like me, talk like me, etc., just assume or presume that it's going great for everybody else. That's not true. And social justice is a commitment to say that we want freedom and equality and equitable treatment for everybody in our county, everybody in our world. And sometimes that takes, that requires us to graciously and kindly but forthrightly confront injustices that sometimes people just let slide because they've never paid attention to the fact they're going on. So you can help with that if you're interested and by getting more involved with peace and joining us at the action that we'll be promoting in the weeks to come. There's our Connect meeting on Wednesday. We'll cycle through these. I think we've got most everything covered. Very good. At this time, uh, if our, uh, those who will be receiving our offering, thank you for what you get to support the work of our church. Um, you are more important than any amount of money that you could possibly give, but we do need your, your financial contributions, uh, the practical matters of ministry of any congregation, as well as the things we're trying to do have to be sustained through your efforts. When you talk about money, you've always heard preachers abuse this. I don't take for granted anything anybody gives, whether it's great or small. Sometimes the smallest gifts given out of, uh, out of scarcity is far greater than the tip that some of us give out of abundance. So thank you for what you do give. Let's take a moment and pray and ask God's blessing on it. Now, gracious God, for all things we richly enjoy, we are grateful. Help us to think not just of ourselves, but also others. And whatever people here today or online decide to give to help support the work of this church's ministry, may our church always use it with wisdom, with integrity, and with skill to advance the cause of your inbreaking kingdom into the world. For we pray this in the name of the Christ. Amen. We really appreciate the 
the uh, string quartet for their beautiful music today, and thank you so much for coming and being a part of our service. Will you please stand? Um, you're always welcome back here. I know we had some special guests uh, this morning, and uh, if you're, you're wondering, I don't know, Bella's out probably hunting for Easter eggs, but uh, you've got to admit, this is probably the only church in Lakeland where the pastor wore bunny ears in the pulpit. I might be wrong, but when you're double bunny dared, you've got to do it, right? I was happy to do it. Thank you for being here. We're going to conclu conclude our service by singing together Amazing Grace, at least one verse of it. You ready to go, guys? All right.